All right, John. John, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Um, I'm originally from Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts. Tell me about your family. Two older brothers and an older sister. I'm the youngest. Uh, mom is, uh, was divorced, uh, raised with my stepdad and my, uh, and my mom. Uh, moved out to California in 72. And uh, that's when they had that big earthquake and stuff. And so I guess my mom told me that I had night terrors or something. And they shipped me back to Massachusetts to live with my grandmother until I was 10. Because you were then, so scared of the earthquakes. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I mean, night terrors, you know, I was so young. And then moved back to California. And by that time, I was into sports, you know, uh, baseball. Baseball was my thing. I lived and breathed it. And, um, and where I lived, there was a bunch of kids on the block and stuff. And, you know, you, know, you always get in fights with the kids and stuff. And I was, I was a smart ass. You know, I always got into fights with, with other kids and stuff because stupid shit I would say to them. And uh, then I got, uh, and when I turned 15, I went to, uh, uh, to the high school, Alhambra High. I was living out in Monterey Park in Alhambra at the time. And I got introduced to uh, smoking weed. You know, and then uh, right soon right after that, then it was uh, free basin, and I was like 15 at the time, and I thought it was the greatest thing ever. You yeah. know, and that kind of pretty much put a cap on my baseball career, because I wanted to party. You know, I wanted to hang out with the girls, and you know, and back then we had cholos and you know gangs and stuff like that, and I got jumped into a gang out there, um, and I was a cholo for a few years until up until I got married. I was married, I got married when I was 19 and I had uh, twin boys a couple of years later and uh, I was still doing, still doing drugs. I was uh, drinking, drinking then and uh, it was, I was a heavy drinker for a while. I would black out and uh, sometimes I would end up in my neighbor's living room in the middle of his floor in the middle of the day. I don't know how I got into his house, but I'd done that a few times. And, uh, you know, I thought it was funny at first, but, uh, you know, as I got older, I was like, God, how stupid that was, you know, how bad I was, I was such a bad drinker. And uh, then I started getting into Coke. The 80s came around, got into Coke and oh, massive amounts of Coke. I worked for a, a Shell gas station at the time and I would steal all their motor oil to pay for my Coke and stuff. And uh, and then uh, my wife was doing Coke, but not as much as me, but I still kept going and I ended up uh, going from coke to crack, started cooking it myself. Uh, I was trying to raise kids, trying to work and stuff. Ended up selling their jewelry, everything for the crack, and I did that for about two years. And thank God, I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore because that was just a horrible two years of my life doing that shit. It was bad. I used to drive to, to MacArthur Park right there on Third and Bonnie Bow and, and pick up a, you know some cracks, some plates. And I jump on the two freeway. I was living in Glendale, and I would hotbox myself in my truck. And I, that's all I would do is just drive up and down the two freeway, getting high in my truck, you know. And uh, and then I had to go home and then go watch the kids and stuff. And I'd be just gacked out, you know. It was pretty bad. And I stayed skinny for years, years. And then uh, I don't know. It just one day I just I think I had enough, and I stopped uh, doing everything for about five months started working out. I put it like, I got up to about 180 pounds. You got clean. Yeah, I got clean for about five months. <laughs> you know, it was about as long as I ever went clean and then I went back to drinking, but I still kept on the weight. You know, I wasn't doing any uh, Coke at the time. And then I got introduced to, uh, to meth. Somebody was smoking it out of a glass pipe and I was like, what the hell are you guys doing crack? And they're all, no, this is meth. And I went, oh, let me try. And I started doing that and I've been doing that. God, I don't know, for a long time, 30 years at least, 30, yeah. 35 years. Do you prefer meth to crack? Uh, oh yeah, hell yeah. They're both uppers. Hell yeah, because I wasn't, I felt like I needed to be in control of my high. You know, I was, I always say I'm not, I'm an abuser, I'm not an abuser of it. For crack, I was an abuser of it, you know, to the point where I was, you know, going to motels and stuff and just, just to get high in the motels. And that's all I'd be doing is have my ear up against the wall and listening to other people, thinking if they're coming to get me and stuff. Or I'll see people like outside my window, like they, they looked like they were smoking a cigarette in the bushes and stuff. That's on crack. You're just yeah, that was on crack. That, that's behavior that I, I hear from people that smoke meth. Yeah. Oh, meth. Meth. I wasn't. I'm down, I don't really hallucinate too much on meth. Um, I may get super gacked, you know, on it, and and I'll, I might hear things, 
but I just roll with the punches, you know, I just kind of roll nice. with it. You know, if somebody's coming to get me, that's how I see it. You know, then they're going to come and get me. These drugs affect everyone differently. Yeah, it's, yeah, it does. Uh, and, you know, I guess I can consider myself a functioning addict. I still do it. I buy half ounces every two weeks, you know, and that's just for me personally. Of meth? Yeah. You know, like, like the other day I just bought a half ounce, you know, and, uh, and I share, you know, I share it, you know, with some people that need it and stuff. And, you know, I've had girlfriends that, that done meth. I have girlfriends that done heroin. My last girlfriend was a big time heroin addict and she used to shoot up full, like 80 milligrams of it and just like, and it was dark and, you know, it was bad, you know, and she would, she died a couple of times and, you know, I caught her on one of her ODs and stuff. Lucky I did. And, and the whole time I, she's ODing on me, I'm just thinking about what her mom's gonna say, you know? And she was a lot younger, you know, half my age. I was thinking I was like 52 at the time, and she was uh, 26. And, uh, you know, we ended up uh, breaking up. It was a bad breakup too. I ended up getting shot by her new boyfriend at the time and when, I, when, we had to do, when we did our breakup and stuff. I guess he wanted to be part of her life or, you know, I guess he wanted to be her hero. So I ended up getting shot twice by him. And he shot at me three times, but twice I got, I got hit with the bullet, you know, but I, I survived that. And, you know, I just, I don't know, just been getting high every day. What is it that makes you want to do that? It high? Is there something from your childhood uh, that you're running away from or? My childhood? No, I mean, you know, I had, I don't know if it's basic. I mean, I've been, I've been, uh, I've had a sexual predator at one time and tried to get me when I was like uh, 10 years old. Really? Yeah, he rode a motorcycle. It's, it's, I don't know whether I blocked it out and stuff, but I would sneak out of my house to go meet him at the corner on my street. Did something happen? Uh, I don't think so. I don't remember if anything happened, but uh, my mom ended up finding out that that's what I was doing. And they had the police come and they took an interview for me, but I can't remember what the guy's name was now or, or anything like that. But it was kind of, you know, it was, it was, it seemed like I was okay what I was doing. You know, he made it seem like I was okay for me to hit him to take a couple of pictures. You know, I never was in a room alone with them. We were mostly outside and stuff. And, and I didn't realize what he was until as I got older, you know, that this was somebody that was bad. Then I've been kidnapped when I was 15 uh, by some uh, girl's uh, uh, mom's boyfriend. He thought I was doing something with, with her daughter or something like that. And he ended up grabbing me and throwing me in the back of his, back of his car or the back seat of his car and I had to, he made me stay down. And he says, you know what? He goes, you're not gonna go home. You better, better pray for your mom that she doesn't kill herself because you're gonna die today. And I was just like, you know, I was 15, you know, and I was, I was a cholo at the time too. And you know, as tough as I can be. And uh, I ended up, you know, getting away. You know, I ended up bolting out the, the back door. I don't know, he left it unlocked or he did it on purpose or maybe he was fucking with me. I don't know, but anyway, he ended up going to jail, that guy, for kidnapping, and uh, and then, but I, I was still kept partying. I mean, I didn't, I didn't see anything wrong with it, you know, what I was doing. It was like the normal thing back then. Everybody was getting, you know, coked out or, or stoned or drinking. Are there alcoholics or yeah, I was, addicts in your family? Uh, yeah, my stepdad was an alcoholic. Couldn't stand him. He was the worst alcoholic ever. He was just a mean asshole. He was like four foot ten. He was a professional uh, racehorse jockey. And my mom worked all the time. She ended up owning a couple of Italian restaurants. And, but even then, man, I was drinking big time too, you know, in school. I'd go to school drunk or leave for lunch and go to my friend's house and get drunk there, go buy, you know, bottles of Bacardi and stuff and just pound one of those or, or, uh, or uh, Johnny Walker or Jack Daniels. We'd go to football games and I would steal purses from the, underneath the bleachers you know, so we can get money and stuff, you know. Um, I wasn't big into stealing, I, I'm a horrible thief. And, but, you know, I would do it sometimes, you know, just to get what I needed. Um, you know, and it, it, I guess it kind of carried on to my adulthood. Um, I started stealing, got a little bit bigger, a little bit, you know, crazier. You know, I, had, I was carrying a gun with me all the time. Um, I was stealing cars left and right, you know, and, uh, and this is, uh, this is while I was married at the time still. And I got married when 19, got divorced when I was 37. So after, after 37, then that's when it really started, a lot of crazy shit started happening because I had nobody to monitor my drug habit because I was just a weekend partier, but I would drink during the week and stuff. I would 
fuse like oranges with uh, with vodka, you know, and sugar, and just mix it up so it tastes like orange juice and smelled like orange juice. And I just used to drink that all the time, every day. And I'd be at work, and I used to work for a, one of those warehouse companies, you know, Costco's. And I, I made it up to a, a junior manager, making pretty good money too, like a sixty-two thousand a year, and that was like in nineteen ninety-eight. And you were using? I was using every day, every day. I get up, and that's the first thing I would do: a smoke lighter. a bowl or snort a line, you know, whatever it got me going, and then take my Sunny D's that I used as thinking that you know they were my orange juice and stuff, and I go to work, and I work. I work every day. You were a functional addict. I was functioning. Yeah, I was how functioning. Many years, how many years did you do that? Oh God, I mean, until until recent. I mean, until now. I mean, I did uh, 13 years with that company. And that was I, meth you were using. Yeah, I was doing meth. Yeah, at the time, and I was drinking too. You know, and, and marijuana used to be a big thing for me. I used to just crave that all the time, but then that just got. I stopped doing uh, What's marijuana. What's your opinion on functional drug addicts? Uh, somebody who can get up and go to work every day. But you think it's possible? Yeah, it is. It's, it's very possible. I, I do it. I do it every day. I still do it to this day. I mean, I uh, now I, I don't I don't rush myself. I'm late every day, but uh, I'm there though. I'm there to work. And I used to have a rule that I don't get high at work because I didn't want to be embarrassed of getting caught. And that's my thing. I don't want anybody to know that I get high. So I function as a normal person throughout the day. And stopping is not an option? Uh, if somebody gave me a reason to. If, if there was somebody out there that gave me a reason to not to do it anymore, then I probably would. I mean, I'm 56 going on 57. You know, I'm going to be an addict until, I'm, until I die, maybe. I don't want to quit. I don't want to quit. What it, does crystal meth do for you at this point? It calms me down. Calms you down. Yeah, it makes me even keel, you know. It makes me uh, uh, more tolerable to people. And I think people are stupid. You know, if, if I'm not on it, I'm, I'm, I'm an asshole. The real me comes out and I'm an asshole. And I'll tell you to, and I'm pretty honest. I'm pretty, pretty straightforward. Probably one of the most straightforward people that most people will meet, you know, and I tell you what's on my mind at the time, no matter who you are. Have you smoked this morning? Yeah. I smoked probably about 10 minutes before I got here too. Oh, I see. So, I mean, it's just something that I do. I lost most majority of all my teeth, you know, and I, and- Is it dentures? Uh, yeah both of them and I got you know I got lucky somebody told me about you know because I did have a half partial because I only had half of my teeth up on top and my partial broke my worst nightmare ever and I broke those and now I just had this snaggle tooth and then no teeth just on this one complete side and uh, and I had that for did that for a few years and then I was like you know I can't eat couldn't eat then my other teeth started breaking and I said I got to get something done and somebody introduced me to some uh, some Somebody was doing something on the internet for uh, dental grants. You know, they can give you some implant grant. And I knew it was a kind of like a, you know, marketing thing. You know, you go in there and they, they tell you that they'll drop the price off, but they're really not doing that. They're just, you know, getting you in there and giving you the price that they normally would. And that's fine with me because I'm not gonna pay that bill, you know? And, and so, you know, I just put down a little deposit and then the rest is history. You know, I got teeth and now I can smile. I'm still learning how to smile. And I've had these probably about three years now. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's hard for me to, to, to show my teeth or something. I'll just still keep my mouth shut, you know? And they say, hey, you got nice teeth. And I'm like, oh yeah, and then I'll show my teeth. But, uh, you know, I deal with like stress and everything with jokes. You know, people say I'm real funny, I should do stand up. <laughs> and so I just like, you know, all I do is just make fun of other people, you know? And they think it's funny, but I make fun of myself more than anything else. You know, I've, I've you know, if people are uncomfortable with uh, with with gay gay people, I, I make it I make them think that I was I'm gay as well. You know, just so that you know, just so they they see that oh, there's somebody like you know I consider myself not a tough guy, but I'm not afraid. You know, I'm not afraid of anything um, except getting caught. That's the only thing I'm afraid of, is getting caught and being exposed that I'm a drug addict, you know? Which, What's your biggest regret? Uh, that, I, that I walked away from a career that could have, you know, made my life a little more easier. You know, it was, um, it was, it was it, it, at the time it felt easy to do. I felt smart that I was doing the right thing. I was walking away from a career and I didn't want that company to know that I was an addict, that I was addicted to alcohol and, and meth at the time. 
because when I got divorced, it just went south. You know, nobody had to monitor me, which was great. Could you have been functional on crack? No, no, I was not functional on, on cocaine. Crack. You, on cocaine, you on could. On cocaine, I could. Oh, cocaine, yeah, I could. I can, I can uh, I a lot of be up all night long, all night long. And then if I had to go to work, I just I go out and get a, or I would have a bottle of Nyquil, and I would down a bottle of that just so I can get some sleep. You know, and I sleep my two hours, and then I get up and. What's, what's, I your, hit sli- the, what's your sleep schedule like now? Oh, the- God, uh, you can probably almost consider me an insomniac. It's very little sleep. I'll probably nod sometimes. You know, if something's boring, you know, I'll nod real quick. But I can hear what's going on, and then I'll just wake up. But if I get like two hours in, I'm refreshed. Like today, like today, I got a couple hours you in. You go some nights with no sleep. Yeah, I'll go days, days without it, and still be functioning, still going to work. I have a guy that I work for who does construction and stuff, and he picks me up and everything. I lollygag, you know, I take my time as I get ready to go, and I say, no, I'm not ready yet. I got to take my dog for his walk first, hold on, you know, and I, and I have a great dog. And, uh, and then, I, then I'm ready, you know, and he knows that I do meth and stuff, and he, he's sober and he's religious and stuff, and he's always telling me, why you got to be doing that shit? Why you got to be doing that shit? I said, so I'm not an asshole to you. <laughs> That's why. So that way you don't get a prick coming working for you because that's what you'll get. You know, you get somebody that's straight out and I'll look at every flaw that you have and I'll point it out to you, you know, just because I can, because I don't give a shit. You know, I'm, I feel that I'm at the age, I don't give a, I don't give a flying fuck. You know, people come up with me with their problems because they believe that I'm intelligent and I give them sound advice. Okay, yeah, maybe so, but I really don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck what's going on with you or you or you or you. I don't care what anybody's doing. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what your problem is. If something's sad, I, I don't want to hear it. You know, these are shoulders not to cry on. If you want to cry, go to the bathroom and cry in there. You have kids? I have twin boys, yeah. They're men now. They're in their 30s. Yeah, you raised them? Yeah, up until I was four, they were 14. Then I got divorced and then uh, I had a house. You know, had a couple cars, a couple dogs, swimming pool. You know, I was living the dream. You know, I bought my first house when I was 32 and, uh, and ended up having to sell it, you know, after the divorce. I wish we didn't have to do that. California sucks. You know, you got to split all your, your, your assets and stuff. But, uh, you know, my wife fucked around on me with my best friend and that, that really set me off. I mean, you know, she was, she was going to die. <laughs> She was gonna die the de- that day that I found out, and I had set it up for her where uh, she had sent some email to a, my best friend at the time and something about how he misses, miss hearing his voice and some other bullshit. And I made a whole bunch of copies of it. It was an email because even her, our house uh, computer at the time, you know, back then, you know, computers were still fairly new, and and I would use her email to play uh, NFL games, you know, bet on games. And so I saw the email draft, so I hit, you know, opened it up and it was to my best friend like eight days after my birthday and her apologizing for the Friday, which was my birthday, that she couldn't hang out with me on that or hang out with him on that day. So I made a whole bunch of copies after, you know. How does that kinda, feel? Uh, it feels, it still drains me, you know, it's like I feel the blood drain from my head, you know, down my shoulders all the way to my hands, you know, that's where it stops the blood and I just feel empty inside. You know, and I was planning on being married to this woman until we were old. You know, I got married when I was 19, got divorced when I was 37. That's a pretty long time. You know, raised kids, you know, we, we both had careers. Um, you know, I had money in my pocket all the time. It was, you know, it was a good time in my life. And then that, just that one moment, you know, and just kind of just, I just pissed it all away after that. You know, she, I told her there was an emergency at home. I said, come home. And, uh, and so she came home and, uh, and she peeked in like, you know, to see what was up. And I said, come on in, lock the door. And I was going to set her up to where I had the copies of uh, the, her draft that she was sending to my friend. And I was just going to throw them at her. And they were just going to fall to the floor. And she, as she went to go bend down, I was going to come around the couch with my bat. And then I, wanted to, I was going to smack her right on top of her head and just split her head open. Just that. And I had no, no remorse or nothing. I just knew that that's what I was going to do. And I didn't care about whether my kids were going to be without parents or anything like that. I just knew that, that she fucked up. She did something that, that she shouldn't have done, you know, and. Is that what happened? 
no, lucky, I, I'm a science kind of person. And so when I threw the paper and they all went to the floor except this one. And this one just floated up to her chest and she grabbed it like that. And by that time I was already coming around the couch with the bat and she saw me and she ran around the kitchen table. And I told her, I said, today you're gonna die. I said, what is that? And so, you know, we started, she started to explain herself, you know, about what, what she was sending and stuff. And it was all bullshit, you know, it was all bullshit. And I told her, I said, today you're gonna die and, and your kids are gonna be without parents because I'm, I'm not running, I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna, you know, stay here, you know, until the police come and arrest me because, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing left for me here. And I was, and that's when I started getting, I started, I drank a lot that day after I found out. And then, uh, so she, so I, she convinced me that, you know, that it was really nothing, it was really nothing. And, and I said, well, I said, I'll, I'll be back. And I went to leave and I was gonna go to his house and I was gonna kill him. And I saw her jump on her phone and I stopped and I had my truck and I backed it up and I came back to the house. And I, I knew she was gonna call him cause he had, he had guns and stuff. And so I let, I let her stay there. I let her stay at the house and I, I went to move out. And, uh, and then when I came, I came back like about a week later and I told her that she needed to move out. You know, that it's not right that she has a place to live. You know, I can raise the kids myself. And I was still working at the, oh, I was on vacation at that time. And so I had a little free time on my hands. And, uh, and I gave her a suitcase about this big. And I said, whatever you can stuff in there, you can take with you. I said, so get to stuffing. And I said, and I don't want you to talk, talking to my best friend again. And she said, she told me, no, I'm not gonna stop. And I was, and then by that time I was just like, fuck this. I said, so that's when I started, I really started drinking. And I just wanted to just escape, you know, what was happening because it didn't seem real. You were married was, almost 20 years? Yeah, 18 years, 18 years. And, uh, you know, we, we still talk, you know, we talk once in a while. I still see my boys, you know, I still see these 14 year olds. They're, they're in their thirties and I see 14 year old boys, you, you know. Still, are you still angry with her? Uh, no, no, I, I forgave her a long time ago. And it took her four years to apologize to me though. You know, and she goes- We're and, all human. Yeah, and she goes, we're, we're if there's anything I can do, you know, to help you through this. And I said, yeah, there's one thing you can do. I said, you can go through what I went through. I want you to feel what I felt, you know, cause, um, cause it was bullshit. I mean, I, I, I hated people. I hated people that were happy and, and, and being couples and stuff. I was, I became an angry, angry man. And then I started to become violent once I was, you know, once we were already divorced and separated and stuff. And, and anybody that said anything stupid to me, I was on them. And by that time, you know, like I said, I, I picked up a little bit of weight and I put some muscles on and I was affiliated to, to a gang. And, and so anytime I had any trouble, I would call, call the homies and they would, we would come and we would take whatever we wanted. I used to run around with a barber's razor and hold it to people's scalps just to collect money for something, make a measly $300, you know, on like a thousand dollar debt, or I just start taking all their stuff, whatever I thought was worth money, you know, and, and uh, never got in trouble for it. You know, I fear, you know, people fear people that are serious and I, my eyes were dead too. That's why I still cover my eyes, you know, because I, I know what that guy looks like, you know, with those dead eyes. And it was, I was dead and I didn't care either back then either. And uh, so I got a bad reputation. People wouldn't allow me in their, their homes. They were my friends. I would have to make a phone call to get in. And, and so I just started doing, you know, more and more meth. God, how much meth I used to do. I used to buy, I used to buy pounds of it for a friend and he would give me a pound. And so it'd be like five pounds at a time. He'd give me one pound out of the five. I can keep it and sell it. Man, I was, snorting it, I was shooting it, I was smoking it, whatever, whatever to get that high that I wanted. And, uh, and then uh, one day, and then that, the differences between smoking, shooting and... Yeah, there's big differences snorting. in all three. You know, it all depends, you know, you can get, you can get some method that is good for smoking. You can also do a turkey baster, I've heard. I can do turkey baster, I've done that. <laughs> I've done that. I've had, you know, I've had girlfriends that are, you know, I have many, many girlfriends after I got divorced and, you know, and I like, 
I like them all. I like them all, no matter what they are. Being, you know, big girls, you know, skinny girls, you know, uh, Mexican, black. You know, right now I'm into black girls. <laughs> you know, there's a couple of black girls that are that are hang out and that I that I know that I like. You know, we fooled around. You know, I fooled around. God, I've been with so many women. It's unreal. From 37 into my age now. Does crystal know. meth help with that? Um, yeah, it does I've actually. Heard, I've heard that. Actually, it does. It, it, it does help me. But, you know, I'm 56 years old, so I need a pill on occasion. You know, uh, other than that, see, I need something for you to, to beat that desensitization, you know, the, the being desensitized, you know. You know, watch a lot of porn, you know, do a lot of jacking off, you know. Uh, uh, and, but I get, I find the sexy girls, and that's what turns me on, is girls that are sexy, that do things weird. My first girlfriend, after I got divorced, she was bisexual. And I call her my teacher, and she pretty much taught me a lot of things. And, she liked to strap one on on occasion. And, you know, she wanted me to fuck some guy. And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to be fucking no guy. I'll let him suck my dick for you. But, you know, that's about it. I don't want to be fucking no guy. I don't want no hairy asshole or anything like that. I said, but you can fuck me if you want. And so she thought that was great. So I let, we used to let her fuck me once, you know, once in a while and stuff. And that was fun. You know, it was fun because she was an aphrodisiac, this girl. I mean, anywhere we went, people were just drawn to her. And we would have, you know, three sums and five sums, you know, like a little carousel of, 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 of people, you know, that I don't even know or she barely even knew. Would that be happening if you guys weren't on meth? Uh, probably not, probably not, you know, but uh, it was, it was, you know, I had some good times and, but you know, like those, those relationships, all my relationships that were with drugs, it was, they were all, they all ended, you know, maybe not all bad, but they ended, you know, we just kind of moved on and did something or something. My last girlfriend, she was a lot younger, I mean, you know, but, she was just a horrible girlfriend. She just was just horrible for me, and everybody kept saying that. But you know, she was a good fuck. You know, and that's all I saw. You know, that she was a good fuck, even though she was doing heroin, heroin, which I hated, because I had friends that did heroin, and I had friends die from it, from fentanyl. I had them die from it, and you know, and I didn't want somebody dying in my care. You know, I I, was, I felt that I had a certain. Uh, uh, certain level of, uh, of respect that I, that I believe that I had from people that, you know, they trusted me and stuff. Cause I'm not, like I said, I'm pretty honest. And, you know, I, nowadays I don't steal from anybody. I don't take their stuff. And, you know, if I find a wallet on the floor now and days, even if it had money in it, you know, I, I give that person a chance, you know, and I'll either mail it to them. If I don't mail it to them, then I'll try to find something that I can call them with. You know, if they have like a doctor's card or something, I let them know that I found their wallet or something. Just give them that opportunity before I have to take it. But I've done some real crime stuff, man. Real crime stuff. You know, I've done home invasions. And, uh, and you're living on the streets now. Yeah. 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 I, you lived in, I lived in a... It goes hand in hand. Uh, yeah, I went from... I was living with a friend before I went super homeless. Um, I was living with a friend for about three years, and then they moved to Palmdale. And a friend of mine dropped off. He had a, a pop-out trailer. And it was a joke. It was a joke. He goes, oh, I heard you going homeless. So I brought you this pop out trailer, you know, for you to live in. And, you know, I made fun of it and everything. And I was going to fix it up and sell it, you know, and make some money off of it. But no, I ended up living in it. And I lived in that thing for about a year and a half. And then I went from that to a, a to a motor home and then from a motor home to another motor home. And then I finally I got some EDD when EDD was happening. Everybody was doing that unemployment. I got some money in and I bought him another motorhome, which I ended up giving it to my last girlfriend, which was a mistake, you know? Um, and then uh, I just, and then from there, I went from this last motorhome that I was in to living in like a tent, I guess, or a fixed, uh, you know, housing with, the, with pallets, you know? And uh, it's cold and rainy at times, man. And it's pretty bad. I mean, this, that, this year is probably one of the worst years, I think, for being out on the streets. You know, with the rain and everything, the nonstop rain and stuff, and you know, you can't get warm enough. You know, and I got a dog too, and I hate that my dog's being put through what I've been put through. So, you know, the housing came, and, and you know, they say hey, we'll get you in a home, and you know, and all I really care about is my dog. Then you know, he's he gets a better life, you know, or, or lives better. But he's so loyal, and and you know, and he knows what's up with me, and. You know, when it's cold days and stuff, he just gets right up in my face. And I got a bull mastiff, uh, American Bulldog, and he's a runt. And I got that. Uh, and, I, and somebody was walking down the street with him, wanted a good home for him. 
And, uh, and I said, yeah, I'll give him a good home. I'll give him a good home. And I told my girlfriend, I said, here, this is, you know, your birthday gift. Because we were talking about getting an animal. And, but she never took care of it. She's horrible. Like I said, a horrible girlfriend at the time. And so I ended up with the dog, and uh, he's just been around me ever since five years. You know, he's been out on the streets, and he's very, you know, he's friendly, but he's, but he's protective and stuff. And, he's, you know, he's, everybody loves him. Everybody loves him. He runs, he runs the park, you know, pretty much the park that I'm at. And, and all the people, they always come and say hi to him first before they say hi to me and stuff. And, How does it uh, feel to be 57 years old and living in, in a park? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How does that feel? <laughs> Well, I feel embarrassed, you know, and I've seen friends that I know that, that you know, that I've worked for or worked for me and they see me out on the street and stuff. And I can see that, that, that sadness or that, you know, they, you know, that patheticness, like they, you know, they think I'm pathetic or something. I don't know what that look is. That It's that look, you know, that makes me hate where I'm at, you know, that I think that I should, should be doing something better. But like I said, I'm 56. There's not a lot of opportunity out there for me anymore, no, no matter how talented I am at what I do. Because for me to go in and, and, and talk to somebody about getting a job, it's a difficult thing. And like I say, I'm late to everything. I'm late to everything. I mean, I had a dishwashing job for four years and every day I was late, every day, no joke, for four years before they finally fired me. They ended up having to get a new manager in, into the restaurant that I was at and that person fired me because I was late. But I was late every day, no joke, every day, 10 minutes to a half hour, and I lived a block away. And then I go home for lunch and I get high at lunch and then I come back to work and I'm like 10, 20 minutes late for that. You're a dysfunctional addict. Yeah, so I started becoming dysfunctional, but you know, my work was really good. I mean, you know how hard is it to be a dishwasher? Well, I don't know how hard it is. I mean, I'm a Virgo, everything's meticulous and detailed. Being high, everything is super meticulous and detailed and everything takes a little bit longer, but I was quick at what I did. I found, a, I found a way to make it work for me. You know, get in, get out, get in, get out. You know, make you know, sure everything looked clean when I left. So I looked like a superstar. So they accepted me for being late. I had one, you know, I was missing teeth and stuff, you know, and I, I wouldn't talk to nobody. I hated having conversations, you know, especially when I was looking for work. You know, I, I couldn't go in there and just talk to somebody knowing that they're looking at my mouth. You know, so I would grow my mustache a little bit longer so they couldn't see my teeth. Or I told my head down to talk or I have my hat, I'm covering my eyes, you know, so they wouldn't see. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not super intelligent, but I'm an intelligent human being. But there's a lot of intelligent human beings out there at the park and stuff. I mean, it's just amazing how smart some of these people are that are in these situations. You know, they're doing their drug, you know, doing drugs that are just pretty much dominate their life. It's number one in their life. You know, I'm not going to say that meth is my number one thing for me, but uh, you know, it's something I I have a ritual doing. You know, on the regular, waking up and going to sleep with it. You know, John, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Oh God, is there a lesson in this? <laughs> I don't know if there's a lesson. I mean, you know, uh, I made I made a lot of mistakes. You know, I made a lot of bad choices, and and I just got to make better choices. I don't use I don't use meth as an excuse why I am where I am because I'm functioning. I'm able to function. I'm able to do the things that need to get done to make the money. And I do and I'll hustle and I'll make money and then I'll pay for my habits. And if it's something like a hundred dollars just for a day, just for for doing a little bit of work, yeah, that's enough for me. I buy my buy my half, I have a little bit of money, I got GR, I got food stamps, you know. All I got to do now is just get a roof over my head, a solid roof, you know, and that's something that's coming from what I hear. You know, I've, I've talked to the people at Tiny Homes and they, uh, they said that they're doing intakes next week and that, they'll, that uh, uh, somebody from housing should set me up for an appointment. So I'll know for sure whether I get in or not. And then if I'm in there, maybe things will change. Maybe it'll be different. You know, that I have a roof over my head, that I got a safe place for my dog. You know, and he's everything to me too, you know, and I don't, I don't really want to talk about him because it makes me sad, but, you know, it, it sucks. It sucks for him. You know, he's a good dog. All right. All right, John. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. I wish you the best of luck.